Revelation chapter 1. There's eight verses. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bond servants the things which must soon take place. And he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bondservant John, who testified to the word of God, to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before this throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. And he made us to be a kingdom, priest to his God, him in glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he's coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. All the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is who was, and it was to come. The Almighty. Thank you. It was good to be up here uh, with people in front. I know Pastor felt that way when he came back from being away and Zoom is just so much better to preach with people in front of me. Um, on December 8th, 1941, the President of the United States, Franklin D. Roosevelt, appeared before Congress to ask Congress to declare war on another country. He said these famous words that you might remember. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a day which will live in infamy, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the empire of Japan. Of course, we know that President Roosevelt was referring to the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, and the day after that attack, the Japanese would go on to invade the islands of the Philippines, and eventually, they would force the well-known uh, General Douglas MacArthur to escape the Philippines. And although he didn't want to do that, and the president had to give him, my understanding, a direct command to leave, he ended up in Australia with the hopes that he would get reinforcement from the Allied forces and then return to the Philippines. Unfortunately, that was not possible immediately because when he arrived in, in Australia, there were not enough Allied forces there for him to return. But one of the things that he apparently was very determined to do, not just once, but over and over again, was to send a message to the American and, of course, the Filipino forces who remained that I shall return. It was a message that he constantly put before the public while he was away, telling them and assuring them, I shall return. I believe that this promise that one day General MacArthur would return to the Philippines was one of the things that motivated the guerrilla resistance to the Japanese since their occupation until October 20th, 1944, when finally General MacArthur was able uh, from a Filipino radio broadcast to say these words, uh, people of the Philippines, I have returned. 
you see the guerrilla resistance to these Japanese forces were able to endure uh, a lot of suffering, a lot of struggle in their resistance. They were even able to do all kinds of fledgling efforts to help MacArthur eventually come back with supplies and, and different kinds of logistics. But that was possible because they had the hope that General MacArthur and the military of the United States would, would return one day. And this morning, I simply want to remind us as believers and encourage us that we can and we must endure the sinful traps and temptations this world throws at us. We can and we must endure the suffering and the trials that Satan throws at us because we have an even greater hope that, that one day our Lord and Savior is going to return. The title of the message today is Jesus is Coming Again. And what I like to do is look at three points. Um, we're not going to really focus on one passage in particular, although we'll spend a lot of time on one passage. But I want to look at point number one, the truth of the second coming of Jesus Christ. And I want to answer the question, what does the Bible say about the second coming of Jesus Christ? And then in point number two, I want to look at the timeline of the second coming of Jesus Christ and answer the question, when does the Bible say Jesus Christ will return? And then finally, we'll look at the teaching of the second coming of Jesus Christ and answer the question, how should the second coming affect our lives? And so the first point we're going to look at is the truth of the second coming of Jesus Christ. What does the Bible say about the second coming of Christ? Well, one of the things I need to say in answer, this, in answer to this question is that the Bible teaches very clearly that Jesus Christ is coming again. And listen as I read several verses. In 1 John 3, 2, John said, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. But we know that when he appears, we will be like him, because we will see him just as he is. In Romans, excuse me, in James chapter 5, Verses 7 and 8, James said, Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it, until it gets the early and late rains. You too be patient, strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. First Thessalonians 4, Paul said this to the Thessalonian believers, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we always be with the Lord. John says again in 1 John 2, 28, Now little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. And then Jesus said in John 14, verses 1 through 3, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. The Bible teaches very clearly that Jesus is coming again. This is not a message or a, a communication in the Bible that is uncertain. There is no doubt about what the Bible teaches. Jesus is coming again. And one of the things that's also very clear 
is that the Bible not only teaches clearly that Jesus is coming again, it actually teaches this abundantly. Uh, this is not just a teaching in scripture that is here or there. It's literally everywhere in the scripture. Dr. George Sweeting was the former president and chancellor of Moody Bible Institute. And apparently he really studied deeply the coming of Christ. And he had these words to show how abundant the teaching is that Jesus is coming again. He said this, one in every 30 New Testament verses refer to the second coming. More than a fourth of the Bible is predictive prophecy. Approximately one third of it has yet to be fulfilled. Both the Old and New Testaments are full of promises about the return of Jesus Christ. Over 1,800 references appear in the Old Testament, and 17 Old Testament books give prominence to this theme. Of the 100, excuse me, of the 260 chapters in the New Testament, there are more than 300 references to the Lord's return, one out of every 30 verses. 23 of the 27 New Testament books refer to this great event. And he, then he finally says, for every prophecy on the first coming, there are eight on Christ's second coming. The Bible is full of teaching that Jesus is coming again. This is one of those things that just permeates scripture, and yet I'm afraid it's one of those things that somehow we quickly forget. Uh, we are all about the scripture, and we study it, and we understand a lot of what it says, and yet we seem to just gloss over those references throughout the Bible that are reminding us that Jesus is coming again. And this is something that I believe because of how abundant and how clear it is in scripture that God wants to be in the forefront of our minds, that we never forget that he's coming back. It will do something to the way we think and the way we live. So when it comes to the second coming, when it comes to the truth about the second coming, the first thing we see is the Bible is clear and the Bible is abundant that Jesus is returning. And so moving on to point number two, we have the timeline of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Looking at the question, and I believe this is where we'll spend most of our time. When does the Bible say Jesus Christ will return? Now, I know some of you are thinking, uh oh, Ramon better not do it. He better not. <laughs> I'm not going to set a date or anything like that. He'll just call me. Uh, of course, when we talk about. Uh, the fact that Jesus is coming again, we're talking about prophecy in the Bible. Now, the first thing that comes to our mind when we think of prophecy, and rightfully so, is that um, it's speaking of foretelling of events coming in the future. And that's, that is the prophecy we're looking at. Um, the quote I made earlier is talking about predictive prophecy. Events happening in the future. Now, I will say that I'm explaining this from a position of a pre-tribulational rapture and a premillennial view of eschatology or end times teaching in the Bible. And I also will say that good Christians disagree on what I'm about to present. Um, they're wrong. <laughs> I'm just playing. But they're still good Christians. Um, no, really, there's, a, there's disagreement on these things, but from what I've read and from what I studied and from what seems to make the most sense to me is that when you're coming to a conclusions on a teaching of the Bible, you have to look at a lot of the preponderance of texts on a, a particular topic and not just come to a conclusion based on one or two, but try to come to a conclusion that does justice to the majority of the texts, if you will. It's obviously not something that's crystal clear in scripture, and that's why we have a lot of different opinions. So the timeline of the second coming of Jesus Christ, when does the Bible say Jesus will return? Um, let me start by making two general points, and then 
we'll dig in a little more. So the first general point is this, and these are points that we would all agree on, and that is that God has a plan that he will accomplish. That's the first thing you have to understand, that God has a plan that he will accomplish. In Isaiah 46, verses 9 and 10, it says this. This is an amazing verse. God is speaking. He says, remember the former things long past, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is no one like me. We agree with that, and it's true. And God, in that, in those, in that first statement, is separating himself from anyone and anything else. There is no one like me. There is none to compare me to. Nothing we can compare God to, although we make comparisons to try to understand. None of it will do justice to who God really is. And it's hard for us to fathom how unique God is. But the way God helps us here in this verse, I think, is amazing. He says, I am God and there is no one like me. And here's how he explains it. No one's like me. Why? I am the one declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things which have not been done. So God is saying, I am different from anyone or anything else. There is none like me. You know why? Because I know the end at the beginning. At the, I know the, the finish at the start. That's God, because none of us can do that. Uh, many have tried and failed. Uh, but God is, is telling us that he is different. He's all by himself in a category. And it's not just that God knows the future. Oh, I know what's going to happen. And that's all that separates. And that's true. But if you look at the verse again, he says, in verse 10, at the end, he says, declaring the end from the beginning, from ancient times, things which have not yet been done, saying, my purpose will be established. I will accomplish all my good pleasure. So it isn't just that I know the future. I am directing and sovereignly orchestrating it all. I have, in the unfolding of events in time, an intended end. And it will get there. There is a plan in place. God has a plan that he will accomplish. You must understand that when you think about prophecy. It reminds me of Philippians 1.6 and Paul's confidence that being confident of this very thing, he who began a good work in you will perform it. That's encouraging for us just in our everyday lives that God has a plan for me. It's already written out and it's already laid out. Now, does it take away your responsibility? but it gives us certainty that he's going to work in your life. God has a plan he will accomplish, but then also the second point we have to remember is that God makes promises he will keep. Numbers 23, 19 says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? God keeps his promises. And so the fact that God has a plan that he will accomplish, the fact that God makes promises that he will keep, directly applies to how we understand the timeline for the second coming of Jesus Christ. But understand this. The explanation I want to give is really abbreviated, because as you probably know, there are volumes and volumes of material on the end times. And let me tell you, just in preparing this one point, there's so much, there's so much out there. It's, it's hard to navigate through it all. So the first thing I want to say is this. Number one, how does this apply to the coming of Christ? I want to explain first that God has made promises to the nation of Israel that have not yet been fully fulfilled. He has made promises specifically to the nation of Israel, all of which are not fulfilled yet. Um, for example, God promised to Abraham to give him and his descendants a land, a certain geographic area on earth forever. 
Uh, in Genesis 12, 1, he said, Now the Lord said to Abraham, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. In Genesis 13, he explains more, For all the land which you see, I will give it to you and your descendants forever. That's a promise that hasn't been fulfilled yet. And then he made a promise to David. He promised to David that David and his descendants would have someone on the throne forever. 2 Samuel 7, 12 says, When your days are complete, I believe God speaking to David, and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you, who will come forth from you, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. So as examples, this promise God made to Abraham and the promise he made to David have not yet been fulfilled. But we know if we believe that God has a plan that he will accomplish and God makes promises that he will keep, that these will one day be fulfilled. So now with that in mind, I want to look at a passage that has been described as the sine qua non of any student of prophecy. Uh, and if you're going to understand this position, at least, you cannot misunderstand or you cannot at least ignore this text. Um, in Daniel chapter 9, if you have your Bible, if you would turn there, we're going to spend a lot of time here. And I hope that you will, I hope you have that extra cup of coffee today. Um, you're going to need it. Um, I sure did. All right. Daniel chapter 9. If you look at verse 1, it says, In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of Median descent, who was made king over the kingdom of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, observed in the books the number of the years which was revealed as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah, the prophet, for the completion of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely, 70 years. So Daniel is reading the Bible. Daniel's reading the book of Jeremiah. And here's some of what he most likely read. In Jeremiah 25, 11, it says, This whole land will be a desolation and a horror. These nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Jeremiah 29, 10, Thus says the Lord, When 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you. And fulfill my good word to you to bring you back to this place, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Which I think we can get a lot of encouragement from that alone. That God's people were disobedient. They were breaking God's law. Um, and God said, I am going to punish you. And I am going to put you into captivity for 70 years. And the encouragement is that even though God did that, he wasn't going to forsake his people. They had disobeyed, but he wouldn't forsake them. And that's an encouragement to us that when we stumble, uh, he will hold us up. Um, and I think that's an amazing thing. So so basically what's happening here is Daniel, remember, was one of the first captives taken by the Babylonians. And by the time that Daniel is writing or reading this particular prophet in Jeremiah, he had pretty much been in Babylon himself for about 70 years. Uh, different scholars kind of identify anywhere between like, it's like 66 to 69 years. He's basically there. And Daniel's reading that Jeremiah... The prophet said, God was going to bring us into captivity for 70 years. And wait a minute, let me add that up. I've been here almost 70 years now. So Daniel takes God's word seriously, and he starts praying. And he starts asking God, Lord, you said in Jeremiah. And, and it's funny when you read his prayer, he's kind of like not quite telling God to do something he said. But he's like, Lord, you said, and Lord, you know, your word and Lord, do the Lord, you know, and it's, it's an amazing thing, but he's asking God specifically, 
Restore your people, like you said, Lord, and restore your city, Jerusalem. And then in, as he's praying, we'll look at, I'm going to read to you Daniel 9. You could look down at verse 20. says this, Now while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sins of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord, my God, in behalf of the holy mountain of my God, while I was still speaking in prayer, then the man, or the angel, Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision previously, came to me in my extreme weakness about the time of the evening offering. He gave me instruction and talked with me and said, so God sends Gabriel, and he says this to Daniel, O oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you insight and understanding. God heard Daniel praying. God heard Daniel saying, Lord, you said in 70 years you would restore your people and restore your city, and I'm asking you to do that. And God sends his angel to, to Daniel to give him an answer. Uh, and, then, and the answer that he gives is in, in verse 24. So if you look at that, it says this. This is Gabriel speaking to Daniel. He says, 70 weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city. And what we have to understand at the beginning here is that when the Bible says 70 weeks have been decreed, the word decreed is a word that is translated to determine and literally is a word that means to cut or to divide. And so God has, he's saying here that God has divided a period of time. 70 weeks have been divided. Now, this is where you have to follow along. Um, what is this 70 weeks? So the word for weeks actually refers, is a word that refers, and we would, this wouldn't be hard for us to understand, a, a word that refers to a period of seven. Now, normally when we think of the word week, and rightfully so, we think of the period of seven days. But when you look at the Bible, it does use the word that way. But it also adds a different use of the word. In addition, referring to a week as a period, not of seven days, but of seven years. For example, think of Genesis 27, where Jacob works for a week for Leah and then for Rachel. Now, the Bible says in Genesis 27, it refers to the week as seven years. So if we look at this 70 weeks, we have two options to interpret this. One, he's either saying, when he says 70 weeks, he's saying 70 seven day periods, that would equal 490 days, right? Or he's referring to 70 seven year periods, which then he would be referring to 490 years. So let's look at the passage again. Look at, look at verse 24. 70 weeks have been decreed for your people and your city. And the question I would insert right there is, what have these 70 weeks been decreed for? And then he tells us, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. So in this period that has been divided, this 70 weeks, all of these things are to happen. Uh, and if the 70 weeks refer to 490 days, then within 490 days, almost what, like a year and a half, they should be fulfilled. But that is not the case. And therefore, it isn't referring to days. Then we go to the next interpretation, which is referring to 490 years, that these things would be fulfilled. So look then, if you will, verse 25. He says, the Gabriel says to Daniel, so you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. So the key point to unpack this verse is to ask this question. When was the decree made to restore and rebuild Jerusalem? 
Um, and now this question, I will admit, has been answered in various ways and different uh, positions have been put forth. Now, granted, a lot of interpreters don't really believe the Bible, so I don't believe them. So that's a, that's a done deal. I just erase all those views. Um, so anyways, the conservative interpreters uh, tend to place this decree around 444 or 445 B.C. I tend to lean toward 445 B.C., and I'll explain right now. Um, you basically read about the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem in Nehemiah. And that's probably what you're thinking. Nehemiah 2, verses 1 through 8. Nehemiah appears before the king, and he, his face doesn't look like it normally looks. He's discouraged. He has like a sad look on his face. And the king asks him, why are you discouraged? And he basically, and Nehemiah basically says, I'm burdened for my city, which is Jerusalem. It is lying desolate. He asked the king, can, can you send me to go back and rebuild it? And King Artaxerxes grants this request. Now, we come to the number 445 BC because according to history, Artaxerxes came to the throne in 465 BC. But then when you read Nehemiah, it specifically says that Nehemiah was authorized to rebuild the city in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes. So if it's in his 20th year, then 465 would then become 445. So that's how you come to the, the point of understanding the time of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. So hang with me. Uh, look at verse 25 again. He says, so you are to know and discern from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, which we said is 445 BC, until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. So if we start with 445 BC and we add seven weeks and 62 weeks, we should arrive at what the verse says, Messiah, the Prince. Now remember, seven, a week is seven years if we interpret it consistently throughout. If a week is seven years and we add the seven weeks and 62 weeks, that gives us 69 weeks. I apologize for traumatizing you that. Uh, so then if we take the 69 weeks and we multiply it by seven, we end up with 483 years. So if you're following along, we basically have to go from 445 BC and add these 483 years. So if you were looking at a timeline, and this is where I will admit, I scratched my head for a while on this, and I'm pretty sure I'm not going to be able to explain that to a T but I will re refer you. Um, so anyways, you, the idea is that you started a timeline from 445 BC and you move down the timeline to 483, 483 years, and you end up at AD 32. Now this is, an accord, this is according to a man by the name of Sir uh, Walter Anderson, who basically had to really in a detailed manner uh, break down the fact that this uh, calculation is not made based on a regular calendar year that we would make. And he talks about the fact that it's based on a 360-day calendar. Um, and he gets into that whole explanation. And, and there is a sound justification for taking 360 days. If you look at the Bible, uh, they looked at a month as 30, 30 days. And you can look at that with reference to the flood and other references, and I can show you that another time. And I'd be happy to share some of these resources. They are very interesting. But understand this. The point is that on this timetable, beginning at the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem in 445 B.C., after 483 years, guess who we arrive at? Messiah, the prince. Um, so, if you look at Daniel 9.25, that's exactly what it says. So you are to know and discern from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be built again with plaza moat and moat even in times of distress. This is an amazing revelation to me and to us. 
of God's intricate wisdom and knowledge of the details of time and history. This is an amazing revelation of God's sovereignty. This is an encouragement that we can believe God's word. You can believe it. Now, you didn't have to do the calculation to trust it, and that's the wonderful thing. You just know, okay, God said it, it's going to happen. This is an encouragement that God's word is going to come to pass to the very detail. This is a warning that we must trust God's word. This is an encouragement and a warning that we should be studying the scripture, knowing what it says. So look at Daniel 9 and look at verse 26 now, if you will. It says, then after, after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. And its end will come with a flood, even to the end there will be war. Desolations are determined. Now remember, after the seven weeks and then now after these additional 62 weeks, we are at AD 32. And at that date is the understood date that Jesus Christ rode into Jerusalem, seated on a donkey at his triumphal entry. And so that makes sense. Here in Daniel, we see as a part of this prophecy that the Messiah, it says, will be cut off and have nothing. So it prophesies his coming and his death. He will be cut off and have nothing. And this all adds up because what was it? Just five days after his triumphal entry, he would be arrested, crucified, um, and die. It reminds me of Isaiah 53 and the wording there. Verse 8, by oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due? At this point, it's good for us to remember how this passage started. Gabriel told Daniel, 70 weeks are determined or divided for your people and your holy city. And now what we have done very quickly is we looked at the unfolding of the 69 weeks, but there's still one week left, and that's the 70th week. Now, it's very important to understand that the 70th week of Daniel, according to this interpretation, does not come right after the 69th week in sequence, but rather there is a gap of time an indefinite gap of time between the 69th week and the 70th week. Now, how do we know there's a gap? Well, from my thinking, I believe there's a gap because the events described in this last week have not taken place. Um, there appears to be a break in time between verse 26 and verse 27. But remember, a week is seven years. So what we see here is there is, there is one seven-year period left uh, remaining for the nation of Israel. Because remember, this is a prophecy for the city, for God's people, Israel, and the city of Jerusalem. So one of the reasons I also think there's a gap here is because in, G in uh, Matthew 24, Jesus refers to this, um, which obviously wasn't fulfilled at that point yet. Matthew 24, 3 as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the, Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when these things, when will these things happen? What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? He answered and he said, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, and he knew the prophets, obviously, he said, spoken of through Daniel, the prophet, Jesus refers specifically to this passage, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Whoever is on the housetop, housetop must, must not go down to get things out of, that are in the house. Whoever is in, in the field must not turn back to get his cloak. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. Pray that your flight will not be in winter or on a Sabbath. For, the, for at that time or for then, there will be a great tribulation. And here's what I think is a key to interpreting this as yet future and not right after the 69th week. He says, 
For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world. Until now, nor ever will. So some interpreters say that this was fulfilled in AD 70 when Jerusalem was seized and the temple was destroyed. But as bad as that was, there have been worse destructions before. There have been worse times of distress and tribulation uh, after that. And there will be worse times. So that tells me that that 70th week couldn't have happened because of the fact that there were worse things that happened. So this 70th week of Daniel is what you would commonly hear, and we've all probably heard this tribulation period, this seven-year tribulation period. So when does the Bible say Jesus will return? I'm going to have to wrap this up quick. All right. There's two aspects of this. In the Bible, all a lot of verses talking about the second coming. And if you look at them all, you can get confused. But what you have to do is categorize, like, they're either referring one to the one aspect of the coming of Christ, which is referred to theologically and as the rapture. And then there's another category of verses you'll find that don't describe the rapture, but rather describe the physical, literal return to earth. So when you're talking to the second coming, you're talking of two aspects, the rapture or the return. And there sometimes seems to be overlap there, which gives a lot of confusion, myself included. Um, so we have the question, when will Jesus Christ come back? And the answer is twofold. Uh, we are in between the 69th and 70th week. And within this gap, there are, in my estimation, no prophecies that need to be fulfilled for Jesus to come again. And therefore, that coming of Christ, this rapture coming for his church, is imminent. It could be at any time. Uh, but then, in terms of when will Christ come back, if, if when the tribulation does begin, when that 70th week begins, and if you look at the verse, when that uh, agreement is made with the, the Antichrist, that's when the beginning of the seven-year period starts, according to Daniel. Now, at that point, nothing is imminent. At that point, just knowing your Bible would tell you, if the weeks are years, then in this one week is seven years, Jesus will be back in seven. So that counts that out. Um, but all that leads to this last point, and I'll make this point quickly. We'll get out of here at one o'clock or so this morning. All right, never, I'm just playing around. Um, the teaching of the second coming of Christ. At the end of the day, we have to ask ourselves this. How should the second coming affect our lives? How should it affect you? And you know, as I'm probably, hopefully, as I'm sharing and preaching, that you're thinking and encouraged and maybe challenged, um, not just by the understanding of that awesome text, but by the fact that God knows what's happening. And he's bringing it all to pass. How should it affect our lives? I believe, and the Bible supports, belief in the second coming of Christ should give us hope as Christians. Titus 2.13 says, looking for that blessed hope. We have a blessed hope as Christians. The appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior. The next thing that it does for our lives is belief in the second coming should make us pure. 1 John 3, verses 2 and 3. Beloved, now are we children of God. It has not yet appeared what we will be. We know when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. That's what the second coming does for us. It helps us to be pure for Jesus Christ. And so I just throw this in there that if you are struggling with sin, you have taken your eyes off of the fact that Jesus is coming again. Because it's impossible to be thinking that Jesus can come back right now 
and sin. So the challenge for us and for you is, and your sin doesn't have to be just you're wanting to rob a store or you're wanting to go hurt somebody. You're not trusting God. Your faith, your belief in him, you're losing it. You're forgetting that Jesus is coming again. Um, this is a motivating truth to remember. I, I remember growing up, my mom, when my dad was at work, I think maybe, maybe many moms have, have this uh, in their toolbox to control their kids. She'd often remind us, you know, you better behave. I'm going to tell daddy when he gets back. And then that had a way of like bringing me back to reality. Like, wait a minute, I better get myself together. And that's part of how this truth motivates us. Belief in the second coming of Christ should make us love the Father and not the world. Do not love the world, neither the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, it is not from the Father, but is of the world. And here's what should apply. The world is passing away. All this world is going to burn. It's passing away in its lusts. And the, but the one who does the will of, the God, will of God will live forever. So in closing, I simply want to remind us to be ready. Be ready for Jesus Christ and his return. Even Jesus said in Luke 12, verse 39, Be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have allowed his house to be broken into. You too, be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. Be ready, for the Son of Man is coming. Now, Growing up, it might have had a real impact on me, the fact that i am already, already started sharing that, you know, moms have a way of uh, challenging their children with the fact that dad is coming home from work eventually, and you're going to get it then. And that has leverage. That has a, there's a lot of leverage to that. Um, I, it worked on me, but I have to admit, and you probably already know, that there were times when when it had to go beyond that. You were just not threatened with the fact that, you know, I'm gonna tell him, if you keep it up, I'm gonna tell him. Then there was the point when mom just decided, like, you know what, I've had enough. I'm definitely telling him. And you knew there's no turning back now. So I could remember times like that. And I remember a specific time, I don't know exactly what we did, but me and my sister both got in trouble. And my mom decided, and it was one of those things, like, there's no convincing her. She's going to tell him. I know it. So the whole day, we knew. Eventually, Dad's going to get back. We're done. So I started planning. And I was thinking, hmm. I already knew what he was going to do. He was, she was going to come home. He was going to say, Ray. Which my, mom, my mom called my dad Ray. Ramon and Michelle need to get spanked. And then you knew it was coming. So I was like, okay. So he's going to probably spank us when he gets, when he gets back. So I told this plan to my sister, I said, Michelle, here's what we gotta do. You know we're getting spanked. So let's go into our room and let's put on as many layers of, of pants you can. <laughs> Cause then he won't know and he'll spank you and you won't really feel it. So you got like, you know, however many layers you can get under. My sister didn't like the plan. I said, okay, well, I'm doing it. So I did it, dad got home. Mom said, Ray, I need to get spanked. He calls us over. Uh, so we get spanked. I get spanked first. And I have to act like it hurt, but it didn't. And because I had those layers on. Of course, after he spanked me, I'm over here acting like I'm crying. I look at my sister. And I'm hoping that, Lord, please, I didn't pray, but it's like, don't let her snitch me out, because then I'm dead. She didn't snitch me out. I firmly approve of her loyalty. She didn't do what I said. She didn't prepare for the coming. <laughs> she got spanked. She really cried. Now, I'm not saying that to say that I did the right thing. Obviously, I was sneaky. But the point of the matter is, when you know something's coming, it's foolish not to prepare. And we know, the Bible is very clear, 
Jesus is coming again. He will come. Regardless of interpretation, it could be before the tribulation, in the middle or after, he'll be here. So what I'm saying this morning is this, this afternoon now, um, be ready. Be ready. Not just for yourself, but encourage others to be ready. And, and that God would help us as a church to continue to keep our eyes on Christ, to continue to be ready for Jesus. He's coming. Don't get too comfortable in this earth. Don't get too uh, grasping for in this earth. Jesus is coming again. So I challenge you to ask yourself, am I forgetting that Jesus is coming again? And may the Lord revive us with this truth that he's coming. And may we close in prayer, praying as John prayed in Revelation, even so come, Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the promises of your word. We thank you that you love us. We thank you that you have plans for us and that you have promised to come again. Lord, you know our hearts are easily troubled. You know we easily and quickly forget you. But Lord Jesus, by the power of your Holy Spirit, cause us here at Bethel to be motivated to awake uh, from sleep even. Because our salvation is nearer uh, than when we first believed. Lord, uh, make us to be eagerly awaiting your coming. We thank you for your precious word. We ask that you bless it now. We ask that you bless our uh, time as we continue here as a body, celebrating all that you have done for us. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.